try this. Right. Now, when they ask a question like that, oh, that's yeah. code for they want you to take one variable and solve, and solve for it. Yeah. They want you to, to write an equation that relates one variable to the other variable. Uh, and the variable they talked about first there was the wavelength. So the wavelength is H over P. Yeah. That's really just code for they want you to find an equation that has both momentum and wavelength and solve for the wavelength. So I could also explain that as the wavelength gets larger, why don't we focus on what happens as the momentum gets larger? Oh, so as the momentum gets larger, the wavelength gets larger. Yeah, that's what they mean by explain. So they want you to come up with this equation here and then explain qualitatively what the relationship is between these. So yeah, bigger momentum means a smaller wavelength. That's something we were already talking about. We focused on how when something has a bigger mass, that gives it a bigger momentum and then a smaller wavelength. And we said that was the reason why in ordinary life we don't focus on the, wave, on the wavelengths of ordinary objects because their masses are so big, uh, at least compared to atoms, that their momentums are big enough that the a lambda would be very small. By the way, is h a big number or a small number? What's h? Small. Yeah. Uh, what, what is it? Four. 10 to the negative 34, right? So does it naturally tend to give big lambdas or small lambdas? Yeah, if there's h is small on the right, lambda would tend to be small on the left unless we have a teensy tiny momentum over here. This again explains why people don't normally notice wave particle duality in their ordinary life. We don't notice the wavelengths of ordinary objects because the wavelength comes from h, which is this teensy tiny number, 10 to the negative 34. The only way to actually get a, a, a fairly big lambda out of here is to have a very small mass in your momentum. And remember, and we saw, uh, even when you get a, a fairly big wavelength, it's only big relative to, say, the atom. So we were working with the electron, and we said it had a big wavelength of like uh, 0.7 nanometers. Well, that's, that doesn't seem very big, but it's big compared to what the electron is interacting with. Okay, so this explains, again, the correspondence principle. In ordinary life, this equation would correspond to with, our, with our natural sense. In ordinary life, this would say that things with a, a fairly big mass have almost indetectable wavelengths, wavelengths that don't have any effect on their, actual, um, on their actual behavior. Remember that if something has a very small wavelength, its wave characteristics are really not important. So those are things that might be worth mentioning as part of the answer to that question. All right, but also just to make a general note, when you see an exam question that says, how does A relate to B? What they mean is they want you to find an equation with A on one side and B on the other side. And then maybe explain in words what the equation is telling you. But part of the answer is just to give an equation. Because what's the link between them in our flowchart? Okay. The link between these two concepts is V. You can kind of link them through M, but it's more convenient to link them through V. Uh, and then V on this side is square root of 2K. So P equals M. 
What, what was V again? Is it uh, 2k over n, the square root of that? Right, I thought maybe you left out the m there. I okay, did. yeah. Did. So 2k over m. So if we solve this for V, you would get this equation. Good. Yeah, they're not the same term, so we can't just cross them out. We might be able to simplify in some way. Oh, because really it's the square root of each one. Okay, so um, in a sense you could say this is your answer. You've done what they wanted. You've related P to K. Um, let me show you how you can simplify this, though. First of all, M is the same thing as the square root of M squared. And what's the advantage of this? This seems like a step backwards, but the advantage is now we can put everything under one square root. Until we have to get a, put this under a square root before we can start canceling it with the m over here. So what do we get as our final answer? Um, so you can divide by, so you should get the square root of 2k. Yeah. What was the question? Oh, yeah. Relate P and K. Yeah, so that's what we've done. We've related P and K. All right, so you might want to make a note of this little algebra trick that we did here. You were asking if you could just cancel the M's. Well, you can't cancel them until they're both under square roots. So we had to put this M under a square root by changing it into the square root of M squared. Uh, and then we actually ended up with this M over here. So that's uh, maybe not easy algebra. Okay. Right, although if you solve it this way, you probably want to focus on changes on the right-hand side that affect the left-hand side. Okay, this is kind of intuitive. Things with more kinetic energy should have more momentum. Because yeah. both kinetic energy and momentum are just different ways of measuring how much motion an object has. These are different ways of measuring the motion, so it makes sense that they're related to each other. Okay, good. All right, so here we had to use the flow chart. Before, we did a problem where we used the flow chart arithmetically, just calculating numbers, but it also might be useful to solve these types of algebra-based problems as well. We saw if you want to know how momentum and kinetic energy are linked, they're linked through the velocity. That's the message of the flowchart. Okay? So, see. Is that it? Yeah, that's what I want to see. Which atom has the greater de Moglian wavelength? Um, what is the ratio between the wavelengths of our hydrogen atoms? We know that when I land on the hydrogen atom, I have the same kinetic energy E, and I'm moving at much less than speed of light. So, you have the same kinetic energy, but um, I guess the iron. Same kinetic energy, but so let's say for the for the iron it has more mass, right? So it has more um, momentum, so it has right. less wavelength. Good. All right, that was excellent. My only criticism is that you did that in words rather than on paper. It's good to actually put each of those thought steps on paper. So your thought step was focusing on iron. Iron has the bigger F, which means it has the bigger P. So we just want to write down each of those thought steps that you came out with on paper. Uh, now, how do we know it has a bigger P? Because the problem told us that the kinetic energies were the same. By the way, uh, I can see we kind of made a mistake. Uh, well, we'll come back and fix that in a second. And then the bigger P, then we use this formula over here. That gives us a smaller lambda. Even though you uh, had the right analysis here, since things are going back and forth, it would be easy to make a mistake. We don't write this down. Anyway, we'll get more and more credit if we write down our thought process. So this is a good example of thinking on paper and writing this all down. What was the answer to the question then? Um, so for half of it, which atom has the greater? Yeah, so which one has the greater? Um, the, the hydrogen. Because we just figured out that iron has the smaller. Ah, they're going to torture us a little bit with more math here. Okay. But then like, what's the ratio between them? So now I have to solve. No, but like, how do I know? I just know, I don't have any numbers. I just know it's bigger and smaller. Well, yeah. So what is the ratio of the mass of iron to hydrogen? How could we possibly figure that out? 
without knowing anything about the atoms? Well, where do we go for information about atoms? That's right, which you would always have available to you during the test, right? Yeah, we're always going to have the periodic table available during the test, so we can actually look up what's the ratio of uh, their uh, masses. Should I do it? Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. That's probably on the back cover. Yeah, here we go. So, hydrogen will say it's like one, and iron is somewhere in the middle. Here, 55, 4, 55. So the ratio is? Yeah, but let's just say 56 to 1. There's a 56 to 1 ratio. 